Welcome to the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, and I'm your host, Eugene Borohovic. I thoroughly enjoy bringing you discussions with incredible industry leaders in every episode, and it would mean a lot to me if you could rate the podcast in your favorite player and hit that bell to be notified of future episodes. I've been intrigued by virtual reality therapies, and I've had the pleasure of hosting Josh Sackman from Applied VR, Aaron Ghani from Behavior, Andrew Jackson and Neil O'Driscoll from Shine VR, and more to come, I'm sure. We're seeing a broader consolidation of digital health solutions this year to bring together the amazing talent, upstream customers, and the scientifically validated assets to drive scale in the market and improve unit economics doing that. So on the heels of last week's announcement of the merger between Fern Health and Behavior, we wanted to replay my episode with Aaron Ghani, CEO of Behavior. Enjoy the replay. Aaron, welcome to the DTX podcast. Been really looking forward to this discussion and would love for you to introduce yourself, who you are, a bit of your background, and our listeners expect a small, interesting fact about yourself as well. Well, thanks, Eugene. It's great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this. So who am I? Well, I'm the founder and CEO of Behavior. We are in the mental and behavioral health field, creating digital therapeutics to address a range of conditions starting with chronic pain and well, really in virtual reality, we can best address things related to fear and pain. So we'll unpack that as we go through it. But a little bit about my background, lifelong technologist all the way back to childhood, all I've ever been interested in. There's not that much to say that's interesting about me. I think I get less interesting every day because (laughs) all day, every day is about the business. My first computer was a TRS-80 Model 3. How about that? To age me a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> many of your listeners will will appreciate that, and many will have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm sorry to say, Aaron, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's my gray hair talking, but just have always been enamored and passionate about what we can do with technology and computers. And so through the early part of my career was in financial services, and then I got into healthcare in 2006 when I joined Humana, and I was at Humana for 12 years in technology and innovation roles. I was the chief technology officer there for my last couple of years. And what that meant at Humana was specifically technology advancement. So my job was to look out into the future, sort of scan the horizon, see what technologies were coming our way and think about and have hypotheses around what we ought to be doing with them to improve the health of our members, which then improve the health of the business. Listen, I used to joke around that technology is not there to pet it. And unless you put it into people's hands and make impact, that's what it's there for. So kudos for navigating the journey and getting to Behavior for the outcomes of the patients. Let's get to Behavior. Tell us a little bit more about the origin story. I think you guys formed in 2016. So please. Sure. Back in 2016, Humana had actually agreed to sell itself to Aetna. So some of your listeners will recall that. At the time, I thought we were three months from closing the Aetna deal. I loved my role at Humana. It was an exciting place to be, wonderful people, I've been there a long time. The problem was I had wanted my own business essentially forever. And I had been increasingly getting impatient about, you know, it's time, I got to get on with this. So we were about to close the Aetna deal. We're three months out. And I said, well, I'll just get a running start. So I founded Behavior, thinking I had three months to go with Humana. I thought that would be a good time to exit. And then the Aetna deal sort of ran into some regulatory hurdles and delayed and delayed and delayed. So the net effect of all that is for the first two years of the company, I still had my day job at Humana. So I had to limit behavior to nights and weekends and early mornings and things like that. So we had a couple of employees. What we were essentially doing was coming up with the strategy, building the platform, just figuring out this medium of virtual reality that we're working in. And then in 2018, I left Humana to focus full time on the business. And at that point, we started raising external capital and really getting on with it from a commercial perspective. We do have a lot of entrepreneurs listen to it and maybe at a very, very high level, everybody wants to learn the key funding journey components and the key milestones attached to it. If you can fly through that, it would be awesome. In those first two years, I bootstrapped all of our expenses and I had sort of two and a half employees full-time, two full-time, one half-time, spent a lot of my own time around the edges. It was a, a very busy time in my life but just self-funded that period. And really that was invested in platform and a lot of learning and prototyping and things like that. In 2018, 
we were bringing our first product to market, needed to grow the team a little bit, went out into the angels and super angels and friends and family, raised a couple of rounds of convertible notes in a couple of tranches, about $3 million over a two-year period. And then in late 2020, we closed our Series A. Late 2022, we closed our Series B. And through that 2022 milestone, Behavior had raised in total $26 million. We also, at the time of the B in December of last year, we acquired Oxford VR, which we can talk more about. Oxford had previously raised about $26 million as well. So the combined funding of the company, if you look at it that way, and we've had two different journeys, of course, but it's around $50 million uh, and have brought together some, you know, a great platform and some very complimentary assets. Let's continue peeling the onion here because I think to the listeners, it's important to at least try to visualize. Everybody knows virtual reality, but maybe pick one. I know you're mainly in mental health and pain. Pick one journey and maybe just walk us through that patient journey on using your platform. Sure. So we work in this medium of virtual reality because it's really nothing like what happens on any 2D experience. So everything we do in 2D, whether it's your smartphone or a laptop or a big screen TV, IMAX theater, doesn't matter. From your brain's perspective, it's not happening to you. You're sort of looking at it. It might be very engaging, might be scary or fun or emotional, but it's still, it's not an experience so much as a cognitive exercise, sort of paying attention to this thing that you're watching or looking at. With VR, it's fundamentally different. We're replacing your sensory input streams, primarily visual and auditory, but you can do more. You know, if you're doing it at scale, we generally limit it to sight and sound. But literally the neural pathways involved there are processed by the more primitive parts of our brain on a pre-conscious level, literally before it gets to your prefrontal cortex. So this is the experience, this replacement of your sensory experience is processed by the threat detection and response circuits in your brain that sort of have kept us alive through the millennia. These circuits literally we share with our cousins in the animal kingdom. And it's really directly wired to things like our sense of threat, danger, fight or flight response, et cetera, autonomic nervous system regulation, freezing responses, and so on. You can see videos, fun videos of people in VR freaking out with some experience. And they know it's a simulation. They were just in the lab, and yet it's largely involuntary. I listen to your podcast uh, where you talked to Josh Sackman of Applied VR. He did a wonderful job describing that sense of presence in the VR experience is incredibly powerful. And so we can do a couple of very powerful things with that. If you sort of summarize it, think of it as addressing fear and pain. And so on the fear side, think like exposure therapy. We can put you in that multi-sensory simulation in the presence of the threat or the stimulus that is a problem for you. That is deliberately driving up your emotional and physiological arousal, putting you in a state where working through that, there's a couple of schools of thought about what works best, but part of it is sort of desensitization. And then from a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective, it's more inhibitory learning and sort of challenging your own assumptions about how you dealt with that clearly stressful or triggering experience. It's very powerful for that. So exposure therapy, there's 15 years of research at the time I founded the company. Now there's 21, 22, whatever it is, demonstrating that VR is incredibly powerful for that. On the pain side, there's a couple of dimensions going on. There's lots of evidence around how VR can literally distract you from your pain, sort of acute pain. And again, Josh did a nice job talking about that. Researchers like Hunter Hoffman and folks going way back that have really opened people's eyes like, wow, this is a powerful medium just to get you out of the immediate experience of pain. But then you can build on that with, we do pain education in virtual reality. We do sort of, if you want to think of it as the flip side of exposure therapy, which is calming. So it's really powerful, almost magically powerful for just getting you into a calmer state, activating parasympathetic nervous system dominance and getting you calmed down out of that state of hyper arousal and hyper vigilance that a lot of chronic pain sufferers are in most of the time. And then with the latest VR developments in what's known as six degrees of freedom, this is how most people experience VR these days. Think about that as the VR headset doesn't just track your head movement, tracks you in space. So this is like with a MetaQuest or HTC products, you're moving around and sort of gamifying movement. Movement is an essential part of how you can address pain as well. 
in summary, we do the cognitive, which is the pain neuroscience education, the calming, and then graded exercise and gamified movement in the medium. Super fascinating. I think to me, when I think about digital therapeutics and absolutely zero offense to cognitive behavioral therapies that are out there and being digitized, to me, virtual reality, gaming, things that directly impact your biological circuitry are just fascinating in the DTX world. Kudos for explaining that. Thank you. I'm going to, for a third time, reference Josh. You know, we're obviously in the same swim lane here with VR. But he nailed it, right? You should not do everything in VR. You should do very specific things in VR because there is a lot of friction still. By and large, people don't have headsets. They need to be supplied. So we have to overcome lack of familiarity and friction, and it impacts unit economics and things like that. However, if you're targeting the right indications and the right mechanisms of action, it's powerful at a whole different level than anything we can do on a 2D screen. So that's why it's worth it to work in this medium for us when you're attacking the right problems. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with Aaron Ghani, founder and CEO of Behavior. Before we dive into evidence generation and your FDA hypothesis, let's call it that way, we touched on Oxford VR, and that's always a tough decision for any founders. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the business reasoning to pull the two entities together as a merger acquisition, however you define it. We'd love to learn a little bit more and the assets that Oxford VR brings to the table with you guys. Happy to talk about that. So as you'd expect, we're always aware and tracking our competitors in this space and digital therapeutics broadly. And then in the subsector of virtual reality-based companies, we had always thought of Oxford VR as one of our very best competitors. And they're in the same swim lane with us in terms of targeting mental health. And so we'd gotten to know them. You know, we watched them from afar for a while. Around 2020, they went through a leadership change in the C-suite. And it was funny at that time, I actually got a call saying, hey, Oxford VR is looking for a CEO. Are you interested? You know, from a headhunter. I said, no, it's okay. I got a job. Thanks. <laughs> I got my own company. But at the time, I did reach out to them and say, hey, maybe we should put these companies together. Uh, it wasn't the right timing. And they said, you know, that's okay. We're going to go a different direction. We had a few meetings. They hired a new leadership team. Deepak Gopalakrishna became the new CEO. And Deepak did a wonderful job of taking, I should back up a moment. Oxford VR is based on the science that Daniel Freeman at Oxford University and his team have worked on over many, many years of how to use virtual reality to address patients with psychosis and agoraphobic avoidance and other things. And Daniel's an amazing researcher. I mean, he's the chair of experimental psychology at Oxford. He's a heavyweight in the field and is very thoughtful about how we can use digital media, not just to be therapeutic, but because of the closed loop and the data richness to be diagnostic as well. And so just an amazing guy. So Daniel was the scientific founder of Oxford, built a platform and some really interesting early work demonstrating the power of the medium for addressing fear. So they did an incredibly powerful fear of heights application, which commercially is not super attractive, but scientifically was really interesting and very, very effective. Then they built on that with a social avoidance product and then went heavy into addressing the significant avoidance and distress that many people living with serious mental illness suffer with. So great science, great product. There's sort of a backstory that doesn't matter that much, but the company got into a state that wasn't very sustainable and needed sort of a reset. There was a new leadership team. Deepak came in, hired some new leadership, really from a business structure and focus perspective, did a lot of cleanup and really turn things around. He did a wonderful job with that. And then early 22, the board of Oxford had been sort of watching us from afar and seeing what we had done with Sumitomo Pharma and our collaboration there. And that's been a very effective, we can talk about that in a few minutes. And long story short, saw an opportunity to maybe join forces in that from the regulatory perspective and commercialization and sort of our footprint here in the US and some of our other investors and so on. So they reached out and said, hey, maybe we should talk about this. We worked on that deal through a lot of last year and ultimately got that done and wouldn't have happened without Deepak and his team. It was a lot of work to get it done, but it has been really collaborative and smooth in terms of integration. One of the reasons is we're very complementary. So Behavior has this platform that we've built up over many, many years. We've got a pipeline of assets around both wellness products to address sort of stress, worry, and sadness. That's the first fruit of our relationship with Sumitomo Pharma. We've got pipeline assets around anxiety and depression and opioid use disorder. Oxford has the game change asset, which is 
FDA breakthrough device designation asset with amazing clinical data out of the UK for addressing agoraphobic avoidance. So it expanded our breadth into SMI. It's a good complementary fit, and we went for it. And it's already creating value for us in terms of opening doors here in the US. So the company and product, great science, great history. They also have an investor who's now our investor, Optum Ventures. And we love all our investors. They're all super helpful. We got a couple of strategics, including Sumitomo Pharma. Optum Ventures is perhaps unique in terms of their reach, not just in United, but really across the payer landscape. So we're really excited about working with Larry Renfro and his team. And there again, I mean, we closed in December and by JP Morgan, life had changed for us and we're opening doors we couldn't open before. And so those are the reasons we did it and really glad we did. Well, that sound means it's time for a question from my amazing partner on this podcast, Chandana Fitzgerald who is the CEO of Health Excel, and as her friends call her, Dr. No Crack. Let's see what question Chandana has for our guest today. Hi, Aaron. Can you confirm how your partnership with Sumitomo Dynapon came about and what the commercial arrangement is? Thanks, Chandana. Yeah, I was delighted to meet Sumitomo Pharma back in the winter of 2018, 2019, when I was introduced to Georgia Mitzi. I was delighted to find Sumitomo Pharma already had a perspective about the power of virtual reality and this medium and how useful it could be in mental and behavioral health. You know, they're big in CNS as well as oncology. And so that was great. I didn't have to convince them of the power of the medium. We built a relationship over time. Initially, it was an exploration of were we a company that they would want to work with. We did a very small engagement just to go deeper and do some planning together. That was early 2019. By mid-2020, we signed our first more sizable commercial deal, which was for us to jointly design and develop a general wellness program. We recently launched it. It's called First Resort. And First Resort is really about two things. It's cognitive behavioral therapy addressing stress, worry, and sadness. We don't make claims about therapeutic effect and specific conditions, but it's also designed to be the underpinnings of our subsequent deal. So in mid-2021, we did a larger deal where we agreed to jointly develop, and then they will ultimately commercialize three prescription digital therapeutics, addressing first social anxiety disorder, next generalized anxiety disorder, and then major depressive disorder. They've been amazing partners. They're very thoughtful. They're very patient. They bring a lot of know-how in the clinical design and regulatory perspectives. We do have different clock speeds, you know, as a small, young company of a few dozen employees and a big global pharma company, but we knew that going in and we've got a great alliance management process in place and we work through it. I'm going to hop in here as usual. It's always tough navigating big pharma and you always need a great champion like Georgia to help navigate and be that really true champion to you know, as a young company startups, you don't have all the processes that the expectations are there. And I still have some tie marks on my back from my time in pharma, even though I enjoyed every single nanosecond. You're absolutely right. Let's hop in to probably deeper discussions that will drive us to some of the more recent news in the PDT space, but let's actually back up. I know you mentioned you have some wellness products and you have uh, pursuing FDA approvals for others. Can you walk our listeners through some decision-making processes to even go the PDT route and for the FDA approval versus just a wellness and that mix of the product and assets? Sure. We chose to pursue commercializing general wellness products while we pursue FDA clearance for PDTs. That was a very intentional choice for us and a couple of reasons. One is We firmly believe that when you're building a digital product or experience, you need to expose it to lots of people to get learnings and to be able to iterate. We believed all along, we got to put this in the hands of real clinicians, real patients. Obviously, you have to be careful about making claims that you can't substantiate. You know, FDA and FTC care deeply about that. We're very careful about it, but we need to get it out there, learn and iterate. And so that was the primary reason. The other reason, just to be very candid, I never was in a position where I could afford to say, well, I don't have to pursue any revenue. I'll just wait. And someday the revenue will be there. Maybe I'm not that good of a fundraiser, but I was never able to be in that position. So we didn't have that luxury. Over the years that we've been pursuing that, I'm only more convinced that that is the right strategy. There are big, successful companies who have been fairly public lately 
about, you know, we're not sure we're going to go down the PDT path at all. And these are not companies that people would say, we don't believe your science. So I do think that from time to time in the industry, people were overstating the case that if you are not an FDA clear PDT, then you're garbage. And I get why some people may be motivated to say that in certain times. And I also agree that it can be more challenging to separate the evidence-based sort of sound, clinically validated general wellness products from the others. I accept that. I don't accept that if you are not an FDA cleared PDT, then you have no value or no merit. I think you can clearly be both. Do you think that consumers look at FDA as the seal of approval? Two-part answer. One, I'm not sure. Two, we're not selling to consumers. That's the other part, right? I think there's a broader problem and opportunity in digital therapeutics, and that is we need a business model. And no one could claim that they've completely sorted out the business model. There are some success stories. Big Health is a great success and what that team is doing. There are others, but uh, we collectively have a ways to go to believe that we've got the business model figured out so we can get this to the scale that the world really needs. Let's dive into a little bit of the scaling because those are probably follow different curves from a prescription product, getting that into the hands of the doctors, educating those scripts rolling, the reimbursement models, and then the wellness products. I'm assuming you're going to employers and others as well. So maybe you can chat a little bit on scaling and channels. I will say over the long term, none of us have a crystal ball, but over the long term, I actually do think PDTs will be reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis, sort of like drugs or like devices. I think there's plenty of evidence that advanced societies reimburse for clinical value. I think we'll get there. I think it's going to take a while. And so in the meantime, we need business models that serve as a bridge to that future. And there is not one. I think there are several. This is where, you know, my sort of DNA, as it were, with 12 years at Humana and managed care and many of our strategic investors, you know, we had early and repeat investors like Senator Bill Frist out of Nashville, who's launched many companies in the managed care and value-based care space, David Jones Jr., the Humana board and co-founding family, and now Larry Renfro with Optum Ventures. You know, we've got some real heavyweights of managed care involved in this company. So perhaps it's not surprising, but our perspective is that where digital therapeutics and their ability to increase consistency and quality and access while being more cost-effective than any other solution, where that aligns with the economic interests in healthcare is in value-based care. So in a fee-for-service world, you've got these sort of perverse incentives of providers who don't perform the service themselves don't get paid. In an alternative payment model, and there's not one, there are several. It could be per diems, it could be all the way to partial capitation, full capitation. If you have a provider organization that has fixed or semi-fixed revenue, and then they can do sort of whatever they deem clinically relevant to drive a better outcome for that patient. Now your incentives get aligned for them to use digital therapeutics where we can scale exponentially while marginal costs go down, 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 which obviously is not the case with humans. So value-based care is still not the majority of our healthcare spend, but it is significant and it is the largest growing part of our healthcare spend. So if you think a $700 billion market going on $2 trillion by 2030 is big enough, then that's where you want to be. And that's where a lot of innovation is happening in care models. And that's where we're going all in. We really believe, and I'll say this, I was delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you and your audience. I think all digital therapeutics companies ought to really be leaning into value-based care and exploring that because they'll find instead of being something payers sort of instinctively want to say no to, which is something that's additive, it's something payers want more of, which is people who are willing to get in the game, drive outcomes and take risk. And I love your view. I mean, to your point, the value-based care and containment of those costs, while it takes a lot to develop technology products and the R&D that goes into it, but from that point on, the scaling and then off to the human interactions that are still required, but maybe to less people. And so your total cost of patient management hypothetically goes down. That's the opportunity, right? Lots of us in this space believe that digital therapeutics can be a game changer in terms of scale. Finally, we can scale to meet the need. 
We can also change the inputs to and the economics of care models. And when digital does that, when it changes the means of production in an industry, that's when things change in a really big way and you start to deconstruct and reshape industries. And so that's what I think is the macro big opportunity for us in the digital therapeutic space is to be part of finally scaling care to everyone who needs it while we drive the cost of delivering that care down, down, down in a way that only digital can do. We'll be some big winners in that space. Most of all the patients, but that's an opportunity for us to go get. Let's touch on the elephant in the room here real quick. Obviously, lots going on with the pair bankruptcy. And there are some naysayers that are saying, well, PDTs are no go. Lots of investors are kind of saying, well, look at pair therapeutics. I think you addressed a lot of that given your discussion. Do you think that there is room for standalone PDTs versus the managed care, as I've been saying, disease management 2.0, that the DTX is inside? Is there room for a standalone PDT in your view? First of all, like 98% of the people who have commented on PEAR, I think we all agree that we're appreciative of the pioneering work that Corey and his team did. And we all learned a lot from that. And it's incredibly tough founding and building a company. And so I think we all wish him and his former teammates nothing but the best. So will standalone PDTs have a place? As I said a few minutes ago, I do believe... My bet is in the long term, these things get reimbursed. That would allow sort of a fee-for-service direct reimbursement, you know, like drugs, if you want to think of it that way. But we got to get to that future. I also don't think that there is one model that will work that we all have to align to. It's easy to think of conditions where even a very powerful, evidence-based, clinically validated digital intervention or therapeutic may not be quite enough to provide sort of the holistic care model that a person really needs. So I think a lot of us are saying, hey, we can take these digital interventions, wrap them in some human layer of services and care, care coordination and so on, do things like assess and triage and intervene and route to downstream providers and so on. And that's going to be really value creating, right? A lot of what's happened with digital health up until now, up until DTX, if you will, has been mostly human delivered models of care wrapped in some digital layers for enablement, you know, access and analytics and care coordination and messaging, whatever. We can flip that and say, this is mostly a digital model wrapped in sort of a layer of humans to make sure that there's understanding and guidance and so on. So I think when you're viewing the holistic intervention that way, that just naturally fits better in, you know, if you want to call it disease management or managed care or value-based care, you know, pick your label, that's a better fit if it's this integrated model of humans plus digital plus diagnostics plus wearables. I don't see that as a fee-for-service PDT reimbursement thing anyway, even if the reimbursements were there. So I think we need to be open to there are going to be multiple models. What we all need to do is stay aligned with the clinical core of the therapeutic we're building. Is this thing designed right? Is it evidence-based? Do we know it's safe and effective in driving patient outcomes? And then depending on the patient and the condition and the implementation model, that can inform our go-to-market and the economics around that and the contracting and who the buyers are and so on. You touched on humans, and this is the selfish question that I almost always ask. We believe, and many listeners have heard me say this before, that self-paced digital therapies tools are there, as we just talked about, to open up access Clinical care is, there's limited resources always and will always be there. How do you see the other human beings, the ancillary, so such as health coaches in the picture in this model going forward? So we need humans and we know there aren't enough of the humans, right? So we have to be very thoughtful about creating care models where it's the top of license person. We need somebody just qualified enough for that task, but not more qualified than that. And that's not a novel concept. Lots of people in care management have been after that for years. So that just makes a lot of sense to me that depending, again, on the condition you're addressing and the digital intervention, having some layer of human coaching, guidance, intervention at the right sort of top of license level is going to be an important part of making these things more understandable, drive engagement up, drive impact up. One thing I'll give a lot of credit. So Deepak at Oxford VR and Mike Dejadon, who was chief commercial officer there. Mike has now moved on to be the CEO of Autonomy AI. So kudos to Mike and he'll do amazing stuff there. Mike and Deepak did a model at Oxford VR last year before we closed our deal where they did a deployment of Game Change with the Wounded Warrior Project. 
and wrapped a coaching layer around that for onboarding and guidance and weekly check-ins. And it was incredibly successful. I mean, Game Change already worked really, really well, but it had been deployed up to that point in, let's call it like purely clinical settings. This was more of an in-home model with a coaching layer. Engagement was through the roof. Results were amazing. And, you know, we learned from that. And obviously we're going to do more of that kind of thing going forward. So I think that's an important part of how these devices, if they will, are going to get used. Very early data that we've seen with our partners where the coaching is involved, the engagement is much, much higher than with just pure core product without coaching. So pretty amazing. I do think large language models, generative AI, they're going to add a new layer of coaching that's going to be also beneficial. Absolutely. And personally, the way we look at this is always augmenting those coaches. And we strongly believe at your coach that the patient consumer always needs to know if it's a bot or a human, there needs to be that level of transparency as well. That's our belief system. You've described your career and you've been an entrepreneur. And I think while this is a popular one, I would love for you to give some advice to the entrepreneurs entering the space and what they need to consider as they enter this space. Happy to. Often people come to me and say, hey, you know, I love what you did. You left a big corporate job and went off and founded a company. And I think I want to do that. And tell me about it because this is what I'm thinking. And I always say to them, if you don't have to do it, don't do it. And what I mean is I got to a place like I could not not do it anymore. I was going to die unhappy if I didn't get out there and found my company and build it. It's also incredibly difficult. And some businesses would be easier than others. I'm not so sure uh, digital therapeutics was a great place to start. But the point is, I love it. So healthcare first and then digital therapeutics second. (laughs) Oh, and add virtual reality too. It's super easy. But, you know, the thing is, it's driven by passion. I don't think I said this at the beginning. At the time at Humana, we were increasingly aware of the meta comorbidity of mental and behavioral health. We focused most of our time on, you know, where we spent 85% of our billions of dollars, trillions if you look at the nation, which is on chronic disease. But it's when you look at the intersection of chronic diseases and mental and behavioral that things are really bad. That's where the most expensive people get even worse off and two to three X worse or more expensive. So we were aware of that meta comorbidity. I thought it was a big super valuable problem to solve where there's a lot of pain and suffering involved. And I have experienced in my immediate family and extended family, like most of us, unfortunately, the incredible impacts of mental and behavioral health conditions and pain and anxiety and depression and substance uses and so on. I've seen it. I've felt the impact. It's personally meaningful to me. And virtually everybody at the company feels the same way. It's If you got that bug, it's easy to get passionate about what we're doing. So that's what I'd say to entrepreneurs. You know, do it if you are absolutely pursuing a passion and make sure that your business is just as aligned with something you are passionate about, because that's what will keep you going when you inevitably get punched in the mouth every day. I just had an exchange with individual in a large company and said, well, you know, we know now why you left Big Pharma. And I said, well, listen, the grass is not that it's greener, it's just a different shade of green. And to your point, there's a lot of wannapreneurs, but not necessarily entrepreneurs, right? It's a sexy thing to be an entrepreneur until uh, you realize the headaches are still there. Hashtag startup life. We started with you, Aaron. We'd love to end this discussion with you and part of your story and would love to know what gets you up in the morning, which I think I know what it is, but please leave it to you. Well, I'd say if it's 2 or 3 a.m., it usually has something to do with cash flow and cash burn. That's what gets me up at <laughs> those hours. But uh, I mentioned it a minute ago. It's just really about passion for the purpose. In fact, that is our number one value in this company is passion for the purpose. And we try and live it. Everybody that's here has it. The people who aren't here anymore, not to overgeneralize, but I can always look back and go, you know, that person, they were kind of into it. But, you know, this is really, really hard what we're doing. And it is that passion that keeps us all going. People that work in healthcare generally tend to say this, right? I love working on something so meaningful in people's lives. And then when you go into our specific lane around mental and behavioral health and pain and all these things, these are things that can devastate lives. And there's incredible unmet need. And there's incredible opportunity in this nascent field we're in. What an opportunity to take all of those years of science, create these digital things that can scale and change the game in terms of access and change the economics of care. I just can't think of anything better to work on. So that's why I'm here every day. 
Amazing. Aaron, thank you very much for making the time. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from you and your team. Thanks, Eugene. Great to be with you. Thanks for tuning into the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, a production of mission-based media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player so you're automatically notified each time I speak with one of these amazing leaders and trailblazers who are forging the path for digital therapeutics. If you'd like to learn more about Your Coach Health or Health Excel, you can find the links to this and more in the show notes for this episode. I'm Eugene Borohovich, and catch you next time. Thank you.